Allen Lund Company, 47 years young and a proud sponsor, wishes OOIDA all the best as you celebrate 50 years. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Scott Thompson. The OIDA Foundation has another tool in its tool belt when it comes to predicting where the spot market may be headed. Research analyst Andrew King joins the program to talk about what it shows. He'll also break down just how bad things have gotten and when we might see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. After that, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration had some surprises up its sleeve this week. We'll break down the speed limiter slip-up and lengthened broker transparency timeline with Mark Schremer and Ryan Witkowski of Landline Magazine. And finally, bad weather wasn't going to stop the generosity of truck drivers at the Guilty by Association truck show in Joplin, Missouri last weekend. More than $100,000 was raised for Special Olympics at the event, and we've got a report on how it all went down. All that and more coming up. But first, the news with Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Scott. A proposal on broker transparency that was expected to come from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration this year has been delayed. June was the month FMCSA was targeting to put out a notice of proposed rulemaking to address the issue. But a new report says FMCSA's proposal isn't expected until the end of October of next year. The owner-operator Independent Drivers Association criticized FMCSA's lack of urgency. OOIDA President Todd Spencer said FMCSA is completely aware of the rampant broker fraud that continues to take advantage of truckers. He added that the agency should be expediting this proposal and doing anything else to stop fraudulent activity. He said hundreds of thousands of small business truckers simply are trying to put food on the table, and FMCSA has once again turned its back on hardworking American families. FMCSA says it is still committed to moving forward with a rule making and will work toward publishing a proposal before October of 2024. No explanation was provided for the significant delay. Permit season is upon us. A number of permits are up for renewal starting on October 1st. That's when the window to file and pay the Unified Carrier Registration fee opens. Caleb Sears of OOIDA's Permits and Licensing Department says the process is relatively simple. It's one of the easiest permits you can file for. You just go on to the UCR website, ucr.gov, put in your DOT number, and it lets you write in to just verify your information and put the card information in to make that payment. So... Um, It's a super easy one to do. Fees are structured by tiers and are calculated based on how many trucks operate under your authority. International fuel tax agreement renewals also begin on October 1st in most states. Brittany Murphy of OOIDA's Permits and Licensing Department says this one gets a bit more complicated because the process will depend on the state or states you operate in. Some are going to automatically just go ahead and send you out a new decal and you'll just get one in the mail. Others, you're going to have to order a new decal. Um, Some of them are going to require that your third quarter be completed before they complete that renewal process. But you definitely should be getting something from your state advising you that that renewal has now opened up. When it comes to permit renewals, both Murphy and Sears say it's important to be on the lookout for fraud. Be sure to give your information only to trusted sources through reliable websites and be leery of any attempt to collect your information over the phone. Right, yeah, and that's what I always like to tell my members as well, is that anything that you're going to get from um, most of the time, you know, your state governments, federal government, it is going to be an email or it is going – or a paper mail or an email that is from a .gov address or something that looks legit. Um, Because a lot of times, you know, they'll get a text and I'm like, well, the DOT is not going to text you. And they generally won't call you either. For a longer breakdown of permit windows opening this weekend, we have a full story on landline.media. Traffic fatalities continue to decline, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This week, NHTSA released its early estimates of traffic fatalities for the first half of 2023. It estimates that traffic deaths declined for the fifth straight quarter. An estimated 19,515 people died in motor vehicle traffic crashes, representing a decrease of 3.3 percent as compared to 20,190 fatalities in the first half of 2022. 
NHTSA estimates a decrease in fatalities in 29 states, while 21 states, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia are projected to have experienced increases. Missouri's Highway Safety and Traffic Conference just wrapped up. Louis Pugh with OOIDA was there and spoke with me about how things went. But the thing that I really, really liked about it and, you know, enjoy about it, and this is why we always say it's so important for a lot to be at the table representing truckers and small business, was the parking. Because we know there's a big there's a big push, and they're going to do this three-lane deal from Kansas City all the way to St. Louis. Pretty much it's going to be three lanes is the plan. But they were going about but it was very um, – comforting and happy to see that they even had par- truck parking listed in their slideshow. So we're finally getting through to these people. I know I wear them out talking about it, but yeah, truck parking was very much a big thing. Another segment that I attended, which truck directly to trucking, was operating safely around commercial motor vehicle. Very good information. I think they did a very good job on it. And then, um, you know, Walmart, they had brought their couple, their no-zone truck out and had a couple of their drivers there represent. They did a very, very good job, you know, of course, as tr- a truck driver would, explaining, you know, the driving around them and how to operate safely. So I think it was a really good thing. It sparked some questions. Um, and then even I, I asked some questions on the parking, which some sparked some more questions afterwards, just me personally with some other people from MoDOT on what truckers and for parking and stuff like that. So all in all, it was very good. The conference started on Monday and wrapped up on Wednesday of this week. A Texas man has pleaded guilty to multiple counts of smuggling from a fatal tractor-trailer incident that happened last year in San Antonio. The U.S. Attorney's Office said 29-year-old Christian Martinez entered a plea of guilty this week. The incident happened in June of 2022 and is considered the deadliest human smuggling event in the country. Dozens of people were locked in a trailer in the Texas heat. 53 of them died. Martinez is one of seven people involved and is the first to plead guilty. He is scheduled to be sentenced on January 4th and faces a maximum penalty of life in prison. An increase of migrants at the border is causing longer wait times for truck drivers coming into the U.S. from Mexico. KVIA reports that truck drivers have been waiting between 12 and 15 hours at the Isleta port of entry. The Texas Department of Public Safety has resumed secondary inspections. These are in addition to commercial truck inspections. According to the article, the extra step has caused trucks to move slower through ports of entry. More than $5 million worth of marijuana was found in a tractor trailer at the Ote Mesa port of entry last Friday. U.S. Customs and Border Protection reported that on September 22nd, CBP officers encountered a 46-year-old Mexican citizen driving a tractor trailer with a shipment manifest for abrasive cutting wheels. During initial inspection, a CBP officer referred the driver and tractor trailer for further examination. During that examination, officers discovered and extracted 102 packages packages concealed within the shipment. The packages were tested and identified as marijuana, with a total weight of nearly 2,600 pounds. The Ote Mesa port director said even though officials have noticed a decrease in the smuggling of marijuana, it remains illegal. And finally, a recent traffic delay in Kentucky was caused by a horse that got loose and galloped down Interstate 75. UPI reports that sheriff's deputies and state police had to be called in to wrangle the animal. Lexington County Animal Care and Control said in a Facebook post that the horse, named Fast Betty, is now safe and sound at her new home. The whole ordeal took about four hours and had traffic backed up for miles. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Ashley. When we come back, we'll get the scoop on the latest spot market conditions, taking the big picture into account and asking the big question, when are things going to turn around? Landline Now is back right after this. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Firestone tires are for more of everything. More miles for every tire dollar and more confidence in your fleet. At Firestone, we help fleet save with dependable value. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com dealer. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. 
For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Welcome back to Landline Now. Time now to take a peek at where things stand on the spot market. And in recent months, we've been peeking through our hands for fear of what we may see. Here to hopefully provide some comfort, Andrew King of the OID Foundation, which just put out its monthly report for August. Andrew, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start by asking you the same question I have been asking you for months now and starting with for months now, yeah. Andrew. And that question is, what are you seeing out there that could masquerade as good news when it comes to spot market conditions? Do you have, I guess, do you have any good news for us? Uh, that's always a tough question, and I hate yeah. answering it because the true answer is not really. Not really. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people are feeling that right now, and we do get quite a bit of feedback when we send out our monthly report of what they're seeing out there. It's definitely hard. Now, there are Obviously, there are those who, who, who can still succeed in a, a tough environment like now, but but then there's a lot of folks who are definitely hurting. And unfortunately, the rates are kind of stuck, and they seem to be at this bottom, you know, like we've talked about before, bouncing yeah. along. And it seems like that's going to be where we are for a few more months, at perhaps least. longer. Yeah, yeah at for least. sure. And we'll dig into these numbers here in just a moment. I did want to ask you about something interesting. I think it's new in the August report is this inclusion of the spot market cycle indicator. Uh, I don't want to mangle this. So, Andrew, tell us what this is first, and then we'll get into what the, uh, what it shows and what it means for us right now. Yeah, this actually, I, I came across this data while I was looking on LinkedIn, actually. Uh, a couple individuals, one we've mentioned before, and I think you've had on the show, Jason Miller, who's yeah. a professor at uh, Michigan State University. And they have come up with this indicator that kind of predicts where the market turns, when it turns bear and where it turns bull. Obviously, over the last couple of years uh, with uh, COVID there, beginning of or second half of 2020 into 2021, we were definitely in a very big bull market and rates were so high. And then since kind of the later part of 2022, things have changed. And this really tracks it quite well. It's basically kind of averaging out the difference of the spread that we talk about between contract and spot. And it has this 10% threshold. And every time the index crosses that line, the market turns. And so this is really helpful because this might actually be one of the most useful charts that we have in this entire report, because you can look at it and see where we are and how close we are to that market finally making its turn. I know a lot of people were hoping that it would be by the end of 2023, that they could see that changing. In fact, we even talked about that a couple months ago, that maybe during the holiday shopping season, things would turn. But you can see through this chart that we still have uh, a ways to go. And in fact, it's kind of pointing the wrong direction before the market is going to make that change into bull territory or like an upswing. And that's what we're looking forward to, And of course. Uh, but it looks like we have, unfortunately, a few months ahead. Yeah, and it's interesting looking at the chart because you mentioned there briefly the historical comparisons you can kind of take away from it. Um, yes. And historically, when you look at the chart, we're a long ways, it, it appears at least, from where we want to be, right? Can you just talk about briefly about the comparisons comparisons, and, and yes. what it shows right now? Well, and that's what makes it so useful is you can look at past years. So when 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 the index is above 10%, we are in bear territory. That's when the market is down. When we go below that 10% threshold, that's when things are looking really good. And so you can look at past cycles, like in 2015, 2018, and 2022, where you can see where it went above that 10% threshold and we were having a down cycle. And then the opposite is also true. You can look at 2013, 2017, and the last half of 2020, where things switched. So right now, we are kind of sitting above 15% uh, when we look at, especially you look at dry van or even a flat flatbed mm -hmm. uh, is even higher. We're, we're close to 25%. So th you can see that is quite a bit away from that 10% threshold that we're looking at, which I know is a little discouraging. And just like you said in your intro, you kind of don't want to look, you know, you're covering your eyes with yeah. your hands, but at the same time, we do need to be real 
And I, I hope that this information can better prepare our members and, and drivers out there of what to expect uh, so that they can keep their operations running. And that might be, for some, it might be switching your model of operation. Maybe you lease on or do something different. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's looking at different markets, um, whatever you need to be uh, to be flexible in order to, you know, stay successful out there, stay open right now, which, you know, and fuel courses going up, making everything so much harder. Yeah, it'll be curious to, to watch this spot market cycle indicator. I know you will, of course, be watching it, Andrew, just to see when it starts to kind of come down to that 10% threshold that you mentioned and what that actually looks like for everybody else out there. So uh, it'll be interesting to, to keep our eyes on this one. Let's get into the individual load types here, starting with van. Again, this is for August, uh, where the load to truck ratio and spot rates both went up, but looks like it was pretty muted. Yes. So one thing to keep in mind is usually around this time of year, there are two peaks, right? Uh, so you'll start one here at the end of August, beginning of September. That's back to school shopping. So you get a little bump there and then you get a bigger bump as we head into like Thanksgiving for holiday shopping. Right. Uh, and even before then, you know, Halloween shopping has become a, a bigger thing nowadays. Uh, but unfortunately it looks like those peaks might not be very strong like they normally are. So I think that's why we're seeing the uptick. In fact, uh, the van load to truck ratio has actually increased for four consecutive months, mm -hmm. but in the long run, it's still not enough to really change where we are as far as rates go. And, and when you look at actual load posts, so not the load to truck ratio, but how many loads are being posted on DAT's uh, site, it's 24% lower than where we were last year. And it's just a little bit above 2019 levels. And we usually use 2019 as a barometer because that was pre-COVID, but 2019 was actually not a very good year in trucking. So being just a little bit above that is not, it's not good. Yeah, it really does kind of underscore this idea that we're scraping along the bottom, because even if we see an increase, they are rather muted, especially, you know, compared to what we've seen recently. And, and the rise in diesel costs in recent weeks exactly. has really had an effect as well. Right. And that actually might also be why some things have bumped up a little bit, like contract rates, because of fuel surcharges. So you see a little bump up, but it, it's not really enough to really generate a lot of <laughs> a lot of good things. And so spot and contract for van increased two cents per mile. So that means the spread between the two stayed flat at 48 cents per mile, which obviously is really high. And we need that to come a lot further down. That spread needs to shrink, as we talked about before, for things to really change. Um, and then if you look at flatbed, uh, that's been kind of in a downward spin for a while. This is usually when things, like we've talked about before, they kind of slow down during this time of year. Um, but its low posts continue to track about half of what they were in 2019. That's that's a little discouraging, of course. Yeah. Uh, and the low to truck ratio itself decreased 15.1%. Month over month, that continues to decline. Again, hurricane seasons can can change that. That's not obviously something that we want, but that is something to look out for. Um, that's what happened in 2017, mm -hmm. and the potential is is always there for that. But it's it's probably going to be this way until we get towards the end of the year, um, which I know is kind of discouraging. And that also meant that um, spot rates decreased. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the spread between contract and spot in flatbed actually increased by a penny to $0.64 cents per mile, which is 3% higher than we were a year ago. So again, it's not looking very good. Yeah, obviously people out there can't see me. I've been shaking my head pretty much yeah. over the past 10 minutes or so because it, it just it's just bad news after bad news. And it, it really is discouraging. I know people out there are, are feeling it and struggling I and know. hurting. And we keep waiting. We keep hoping that we're going to, you know, have one of these conversations and talk about, hey, it looks like this thing is finally yeah. turned around and we we see some light at the end of the tunnel. We're not quite there yet. No. And one thing to keep in mind, and I know this doesn't make it easier, especially when you're hurting and, and maybe even saying it could upset somebody. But uh, in past down cycles, they usually last a while. And I think many of us maybe were expecting that this would only be a few months or maybe a year and then things would change. But typically 24 months is not unusual or even longer in previous down cycles. That's a long time 
Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying that, to do the math, and that would that would put us over two years, roughly what into the summer of correct 2024. Okay. So that is where uh, some analysts are expecting Q2 of 2024, because usually the first quarter of every year is the slowest time of the year. Um, but maybe as we get into spring, uh, there could be something that that pushes demand up because that's really part of the problem. We talk about there being too much capacity, right? And that's a problem. There's too many new trucks being ordered um, and not enough used sales uh, eclipsing that, as you can see in the report in a different slide. Um, but we also need demand to kind of pick up to really switch things around. And that's also what will cause the spread between contract and spot to shrink. Yeah. And I mean, when you take into account all the other issues that are out there, it, it kind of is a perfect storm in a way with the inflationary pressures and, yes. and everything else that's going on. It just seems like all that pressure is coming down on the industry right now. And we yes. keep waiting again for that relief to kind of to kind of settle in here and, and we'll keep watching. But yeah, you, you mentioned quarter two. I think that's what a lot of economists have kind of been circling yes. on their calendar, right? And we talked about this before. Yeah, we have. And that's, um, I, I would say that's probably the most realistic right now, and, and it could even be a little bit longer. But a lot of different projections that I've seen where they forecasted out to 2025, definitely sometime in 2024, things should switch. But I, I know that's a really yeah. long time away. Uh, we did just have one last, uh, we didn't talk about reefer yeah, yet. And I was just going to ask you. There could be, uh, maybe there's a little positivity there, perhaps. We'll just kind of see because uh, the October um, fall produce season kind of begins, I should say, in October. And, and that might cause a little bit of a bump. Um, the truck to load ratio increased 14.5% month over month, which is which is good. Uh, and spot rates actually increased seven cents per mile month over month. But of course, they're still down 40 cents since last year. Um, and the spread between contract and spot stayed flat as well. Uh, so that obviously is, is something that needs to change. But there could potentially be something positive happening there. And even something like that could could spill over and have positive effects in something like Van. Yeah, I was going to ask you that because, you know, we do see these things pop up from time to time where, you know, Reefer may have a good month or a couple of months. But yet Van is, you know, <laughs> they're not right. having a good month or a couple of months. I mean, is there any sort of bleed over? I mean, there, does it? There is with Reefer and Dry Van, not so much with Flatbed. And sure. the reason is obviously because some who haul Reefer or, or pull Reefer equipment, they can also use that for Dry Van type goods. Right, right, right. right. And so if Reefer is doing well, that's basically pulling that equipment out of the Dry Van market which is releasing capacity, which could tighten things in the dry van side, which can help rates. So there is some intermingling there for sure. Uh, so that could have a positive benefit. But one of the big things that we're looking at right now is is really manufacturing. That's kind of the, the main driver of freight. And we're kind of in a manufacturing recession. We have been here for the previous couple quarters. And we really need to see that change in order for this demand factor that we're really looking for to, to really occur. It really is a solid reminder every time we talk to you about just how many strings are out there and yeah. how many are pulling on this industry and that industry. And one tug here really has an effect on, you know, this sector yeah. over there. It, it, it's interesting. Uh, it doesn't help anybody out there, obviously, that's that's struggling right now. But, you know, a reminder that better times are ahead. We'll keep looking for them. Um, monthly report, great guide, helping po uh, folks out there understand what's going on out there so they can make better decisions. Andrew, we always appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Our thanks to Andrew King of the OID Foundation and our thanks to you for listening. But don't go anywhere. There's more Landline Now right around the corner. When you weigh on a CAT scale, you get a no excuses guarantee. You can now save time weighing by using your smartphone. Find out more at weighmytruck.com. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. 
That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. We're capping off a busy news week with the best way we know how alongside our friends from Landline Magazine. We let them up here when we've got stuff to talk about. <laughs> And sure enough, today we do. Mark Schrimmer is senior editor of the magazine. Ryan Witkowski is staff writer. And we welcome them both into Studio A. Thank you for your hospitality and allowing <laughs> us to bask in your glow. And me. I appreciate the little cookies that you baked for us. We, you I got really cookies? Do. <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that to, to, to Ryan there, Mark. Uh, we got to start with the September significant rulemaking report that came out of the USDOT on Monday. FMCSA did have a few updates that got people, a lot of people, scratching their heads. I'm going to ask you both the same question here and give me a quick answer. We'll start with Mark. Speed limiters or broker transparency, which one of these new developments surprised you more? I will say, for a quick answer, I will say brokers, and I can explain more a little bit later. Ryan? <laughs> I, I mean, I think, for me, it was probably neither, but I would probably take the speed limiter side just to, uh, you know, for sake of conversation. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> crossfire. It's like the old Crossfire <laughs> show. So, so Mark, uh, broker transparency, that's, that's interesting, because I think, for me at least, on Monday, when we thought for a few hours that the speed limit proposal was going to say 68 miles an hour, um, I think we all were kind of surprised and especially surprised when they pulled it back. Uh, but for you, you're saying broker transparency was was a bit more surprising just because of the timeline, I you, assume. So this petition from OIDA all the way back from 2020 saying you already have a regulation on the books. Um, you need to enforce it. Um, earlier this year, FMCSA made a big splash out at Matt's, if you remember, and like a week before Matt's in March. They said, we've granted OIDA's petition. We're going to make, uh, you know, we're going to get something done about this. And they, they said soon, uh, multiple times, um, you know, and they had a listening session. Uh, drivers were very up in arms about how big of an issue uh, this was. Uh, they seemed very committed uh, to to tackling it. Um, we uh, interviewed uh, Administrator Hutchison, uh, I believe, multiple times in the interview. You know, she said that something soon or very soon, that type of language. Uh, this coming, it was on the previous agenda. It was supposed to be this past June that they put out the notice of proposed rulemaking. In August, OIDA said, there's no time to waste on this. Uh, you know, during this uh, type of economic times that we're having right now, this is a larger issue than it was even before. There's no time to waste. And now we're seeing response suddenly it, without really any explanation of why, uh, not till October 31st, 2024, which we can talk about a little bit more in, in detail. But what that means, if we're talking basically at the end of 2024 uh, for a notice of proposed rulemaking, we're, we're not seeing any sort of effective date till 2026, 2027, yeah. maybe. After it goes through the I review mean, process so and everything the, else, yeah. What, so that's why it was most surprising to me is just because that was the thing that said they, they made a splash. And I think they tried to show an effort to drivers. They went to a trucking show to say, hey, this is a big issue. We're going to tackle it. And now, you know, we're hearing a long ways away from that happening. Yeah. Well, you made a good case there. Well, Ryan, I, I yeah. think I think for me, it kind of falls a little bit into line with kind of what some of what Mark's talking about is that, number one, the speed limiter proposal when it came out and it said that 68 miles an hour was this, this target number for it. It seemed plausible, right? Like, you know, there, there had been a lot of conversation around that number and that mark. And so when they announced that number, it seemed plausible. And look, whether or not you're opposed or for speed limiters, which I know a lot of people are opposed to them, like – it's still something that that felt like there was some progress, right? And then for them to say something and then go, oh, our bad, never mind, we didn't mean to say that, and reel it back in and not give you any more information almost felt worse than getting no information at all. Like, I would have rather had this entire week just be scrubbed from the speed limiters conversation, <laughs> and we didn't have to worry about it because we were in the exact same spot we were before, only now there's this target number in your mind that FMCSA has put out there. And anything that goes below that number, that 68 number now, is just going to feel like a kick in the gut. Yeah, and no explanation either, really, um, at least one that makes complete sense as to why it was put out there. It seems like, and I'm 
going out on a limb and, and kind of speculating here, but it does seem like there was a mistake made at some point here. I think that's probably pretty safe I to say. I think that's, that's fair. That's <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I think that they, I don't think that was said directly. Yeah, but exactly. I mean, that was not intended to be in there. It's why they removed it. I think that's pretty obvious that it, that it was a mistake. FMCSA has had some issues with uh, with press releases this week, I think, fair to say. I know they put out their art safety contest. It had a couple of typos. They had some kid's last name is like Radical or something like that. So yeah, not it. It's, His it's, last name was not Radical. <laughs> it's a cool name, would though. Would have been, been very cool, cool if it was. Yeah. It is, I mean, it's interesting. And we're, we're talking about these two things in particular out of this huge report because they are incredibly important for pretty much everybody out there. Uh, you know, Mark, you were talking about the broker transparency issue. And I think the timeline, the fact, and you laid out a great case there in terms of why it is surprising that it's been pushed back for so long now. Um, and realistically, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking, as you point out there as well, we're talking about another two three years before we see action on this. And I suppose if you were to come from FMCSA's perspective, um, they might say that from their perspective, speed limiters and things like automatic emergency braking are going to have a more positive impact on safety on the roadways, um, as opposed to broker transparency, which of course we know does affect safety because sure. it does affect retention, which is where they're approaching this issue from. So it is complex. It does make sense, I, I suppose, if you try to look at it from their perspective, but it is frustrating. I can understand that. Like Again, if you're looking at it from their perspective, I don't necessarily agree with their perspective, but, but I, I hear what you're saying. But they're still the ones that came out and made the splash at Matt's and, and said that this was something they're going to be tackling very soon. And we also have to remember this is a petition all the way back from May 2020, and this is something that's been on the books for, for years. But they, they tried to show, hey, drivers, we're listening to you. We're calling this listening session. Um, you know, uh, Ryan, I think, you, you know, you were there as well. I mean, drivers were very passionate talking about the, this topic. Um, they acted like they wanted to do something. In fairness uh, to the agency, uh, you know, they're saying that they're hoping to have it before that October 2024 uh, date. But, you know, if, uh, if history tells us anything, most of the time those those dates, you know, end up going much later than the date. I and mean, and that, I, oh, yeah. think, I think they, that speaks to— They uh, don't beat the deadline very often. <laughs> no. you know? But I think that speaks no. to a point that you and I were having a conversation about earlier is that— when it comes to like your expectations from bureaucracy and how, you know, what their idea of we're going to handle it in a, in a speedy fashion versus our idea of a speedy fashion, like if, if it were up to a lot of drivers out there, this this would take a week tops and we'd get it knocked out, right? That's not the way that it works with FMCSA. And you've seen that throughout its time, you know, I mean, we're still waiting on, you know, them to certify laboratories for oral fluid testing that yeah. they approved back in May. There's still not a single one of those certified yet. So, I mean, it's not as if I feel like, and I don't want this to come off like I'm coddling FMCSA by any means, but I don't know if this is necessarily outside of the norm for what it come for what it takes in, in terms of a timeline. And look, I, I know that you're saying we're, you know, started in 2020 and now we're going to be looking at change maybe in 2025 or 2026. Is that six year window when it comes to this bureaucracy, because it has so many steps, is that really that that out of the norm? And I, I agree, like it's easy to for them to look at AEB or it's easier for them to look at speed limiters and say, well, we are the agency that regulates safety in this industry, and so these are two, two obvious safety problems. Whereas when you're talking about brokers, sure, there's a lot of safety cases to be made about driver retention and having you know drivers that are, that are tenured behind the wheel. But it's more of a stretch, and it's an easier sell for them to say these two things are our priorities, and this one's kind of backburnered right now. So I think that, you know, Putting all of those things together, I get it. You want to see some change and you want to have some forward progress, but it almost feels like this is the pace that it is. It is frustrating. I mean, democracy is often at times it moves frustrating. moves at a pregnant pace. It really does. It does. But again, just to reiterate this and underline it and put it in bold, many of these laws and rules and regulations are already on the books, right? Yeah. Um that's the frustrating part about this, uh, among a lot of frustrations, is that, you know, these laws are there. They're not really being enforced. We had that audit of the National Consumer Complaint Database recently that essentially said, you know, 
not enough public outreach, um, you know, basically that they're not doing, it's not serving the purpose it's that it's supposed to be serving. And that's exactly what it is supposed to be for is this type of thing, right? With broker fraud and taking sure. action on it. Um, so, I mean, it's frustrating because this is a situation where there isn't much anybody else, as you kind of alluded to there, Ryan, anybody else or can do anything about this, really. This is going to fall on FMCSA to kind of take that step and enforce the laws that are on the books and put the clamps down on these brokers out there, the the small number of them, the pr small percentage of them that are doing a lot of harm for owner-operators and, and everybody right, else and out I, there. I don't want it to come off like I don't think that they need to step in and do something about this because it frustrates me every time that I talk to anybody here in the building sure. about, you know, what what do carriers do if they are victims of broker fraud? And, and the answer is there's not a lot you can yeah, do. Know, like, it's yeah. frustrating. And so, like, like – I, as much as you, want to see some reform with this, but I think that also you need to take a step back and, and just really think about how that process works. And yeah, it's going to take some time. It's nice that they're at least acknowledging that it's a priority for them. And, and I think that's the biggest issue, too, is there's yeah. really no higher court to appeal to right now. True. Yeah. I, you know, though, I I think I would argue a little bit, though, that they're, if you're acknowledging it's a priority, but then also making it way down the list, yeah, doing yeah. it at the same time. And I think that's what they're trying to do. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration uh, comes from drivers. Th this is a real issue. This is something that's already on the books. All they have to do is enforce. And instead uh, of, and I, with Ryan, that government moves at a snail's pace, it always does. But this one was probably an opportunity that maybe something could have been done a year or two ago. And now we're talking about, like I said, the timeline, if let's just say that they don't actually get it done on October 31st, 2024. And as usual, it goes into 2025. So we're seeing March. And now we got a 60-day uh, comment period. And now we get a couple thousand comments. And we're going to review that. Um, now in 2026, we're going to go ahead and, and put out the final rule. Yeah. And then by the time that effective date, we're talking 2027 possibly mm -hmm. on something that, I mean— you know, trucks were, were out there, um, you know, out in D.C., in the Capitol about this issue back in May of 2020. Uh, this was a huge issue. People said we're going to do something about it quickly. And, you know, now we're, we're talking possibly 2027. It's it's frustrating. Yes. I think, and that's I think the, adding the to that frustration, too, is that like razor thin margin for error that could, you know, potentially mean you being out of business if, yeah. you know, a broker were to take advantage of you and you were a victim of that. And, and so I think a lot of a lot of folks behind the wheel are looking at this going, boy, I'll tell you what, you're going to tell me that's the pace it's going to take and it's going to be two years down the road. I don't know if I can survive two more years. Oh, yeah. It's happening a lot, too. And we've we hear the stories all the time of these new, you know, fraud schemes that are popping up all the all over the place real quick on speed limiters here with about a minute left one thing to keep in mind here we're waiting on december 29th for probably possibly maybe more information here um, when the the next notice comes out in the meantime we do have those two pieces of legislation one in the house one in the senate that would essentially stop fmcsa from implementing a speed limiter mandate i do expect here if the, gov if the government over ever opens back up, if it does indeed shut down this weekend, we're going to hear and see a lot of movement on that. OIDA is going to be very vocal about getting in front of this and making sure that this thing is um, stopped, essentially, before it can pick up speed. No pun intended there. but um, Feels like it was. Well, maybe a little bit. We'll be talking a lot about that in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, Mark, Ryan, good conversation. An important week, uh, a lot of stuff going on, so we appreciate you coming by and helping us make sense of it all. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks for the cookies. <laughs> Absolutely. What a jerk. <laughs> Our thanks to Mark Schrimmer and Ryan Witkowski of Landline Magazine. You can check out their exceptional work every day on landline.media and in every issue of the magazine, and go check out the October issue when and where you can. It's hot off the presses. We've got to take a quick break, but stick and stay, because we've got more Landline now coming right up. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com.
Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline now, welcome back. Your way, sir. One of the most popular events at the Guilty by Association Truck Show is the auction and convoy for the Special Olympics. To talk about that, Haley Blevins joins me. She is the Development Director for Southwest Missouri Special Olympics. Haley, can you talk to me about the involvement Special Olympics had at GBATS this past weekend in Joplin? Yeah, absolutely. So we hosted a convoy in conjunction with the Guilty by Association Truck Show. Um, Brian Martin and his team allowed us to joined forces with them several years back, and it's been a really big event every year. Our convoy has anywhere from 200 to 500 trucks that participate every year. This year, we had about 250 trucks sign up, and we had a table at our at their info tent registering people all weekend during, throughout the show. Um, luckily, we were still able to host a, a makeshift convoy, if you will, And we were able to still have a good majority of our participants come out on Sunday morning and drive in our convoy and just spread awareness for Special Olympics Missouri. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about, I know the weather um, kind of put a a damper on things. Um, Talk to me about what happened with that. I know the auction was Saturday, but then, yeah, like you said, you were able to do something kind of on a smaller scale Sunday. Yeah, so we decided that Um, Because we weren't able to host the convoy like we normally do, go through Joplin and then end down at Mercy Park for the concert due to severe weather threats and all of that, we decided, Brian and I decided um, that we were wanting to still host it because several of our participants were upset that we weren't hosting the convoy and that we we weren't able to host the event the way that they're used to for after so many years of doing this event with us. So what we decided was on Saturday, we hosted an auction. We auctioned off the top 20 spots like we always do. And then we decided on Saturday that we had enough time before the storms and um, the concert um, and everything like that happened. We decided that we could get a small group down the highway and back in that amount of time. So we took those top 20. We actually ended up with 21. And we took them down I-44 from exit 4 to exit 22 where the Joplin stockyards are, turned around and came back, and then they were able to enjoy the concert that evening, all the truckers that were a part of the show. And then on Sunday, we had several of the truckers come back and rally with us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We met. We had a brief discussion about where we were going and why we were doing this, and We spread a lot of thanks and a lot of appreciation around to those truckers. We drove the same route on 44 down and back on Sunday morning, and all the truckers that were able to participate with us were extremely excited. They were having a great time uh, honking their horns for everybody going up and down the highway. It was awesome to see everybody just uh, in the face of diversity, everybody was able to still come together and still support our athletes, support Special Olympics Missouri, and it was we were able to have a lot of fun still. Was there any worry with not being able to do what you normally do? Was there any worry with, with how things would go? Absolutely. Um, with, as with any event or with any preset schedule, I guess you, um, you always have an expectation of what everything will look like. So on Friday night when the city of Joplin decided that it was not in the best interest of the city for liability issues and to keep everybody safe. We wanted to make sure that we were still in conjunction with what they wanted and we were still aligning with their 
their request, but we also knew that we have a lot, we had a huge community standing at our back door asking questions. And so it was a little bit nerve wracking just to see what we could come up with. It wasn't really until early, early Saturday morning that Brian and I were able to actually discuss and make a final decision on what was going to be able to happen and what we were willing to do ourselves outside of everything else we were we were being told from the city and, and all that. So, yes, absolutely. It was very nerve-wracking. Um, I was pleasantly surprised with how everything turned out and how smooth everything went. How beneficial is it to have um, events like this to do fundraisers to raise money for the Special Olympics? Um, well, it's extremely important. It's all my personal position in this organization is centered around as fundraising and earning donations from our community to help our athletes in our communities be able to continue to participate. We have local games, we have area games, regionals in state. Um, we also have you <clears throat> excuse me, we have USA games, we have world games. So we have a lot of reasons and a lot of passion on why we want to fundraise and support our athletes. So with that being said, an event that brings in uh, an amazing amount of donations is extremely crucial to what we do every single year and every single <clears throat> every single day because without any of these people coming around and rallying around an incredible group of individuals as such as our athletes it's it truly shows how much our athletes impact our communities and how much these these people in our community genuinely care that our athletes are getting just as much opportunity to participate in sports and other opportunities that they might not normally get. Do you know how much was raised? Yeah, we um, we have a rough estimate now. We still have some donations coming in. <clears throat> but from what we have as of today, we have about $120,000 that came in. Wow. And where does that money all go? Sure. So the money stays in southwest Missouri. So the Southwest area is from West Plains all the way over to Joplin and everywhere in between. And that helps us be able to um, put on all of our area events, local events. It helps us conduct all of our regional events. We're able to also help teams out as they need it for travel or for new equipment, new uniforms, stuff like that. All of that money that we earn from all of our fundraisers collectively goes together so that we can support all of our athletes. And you were at the show. How did it feel to see um, all the drivers that came out um, that were still bidding for those spots and, and making donations? It was very emotional to, to have thrown out so many what-ifs and so many possibilities of the show being canceled and with the convoy being canceled and being able to rally ourselves back and say, no, we can totally do this with the help of Brian and his crew over at four state trucks, bringing that all back and then seeing that our passion and our excitement to continue being able to host this event showed through all of our participants and all of our donors. It was just it was really cool to see. I There's not a whole lot of words to describe it other than it was just awe-inspiring to see everybody just really come back and say, you know what, we're here for the right reasons, and we really want to support what, the reason we're here. So this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to participate. And we had almost $80,000 raised in our auction alone. Ed Humfeld was one of the top donors for the auction. Jamie Jones caught up with him before the convoy. Tell me what it, why you were bidding for a top spot in the convoy. We believe in helping out the organization that is for the Special Olympics. Um, we are a very family-oriented company, and uh, we give when we can. Is this your first convoy that you bid on? It's actually my second. I was number two two years ago. What got you involved initially with the Special Olympics convoys? It was kind of a dare with some friends a couple years ago, and then it's just become an a outreach that we like to give to.
That was Ed Holmfeld and Haley Blevins talking about this year's auction and convoy at GBATS to raise money for Special Olympics. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. That's our show for today. Thank you for tuning in and be sure to join us again tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.